I am always honored and privileged, man, to be able to speak to men. And uh, I don't, I don't feel like I have a claim on week six, though week six is my favorite, my favorite, uh, my favorite call to teach. I love to teach week six. Uh, we, we are kind of commissioned. It's kind of our habit to choose a word. And so my word for tonight is hand. It's hand, H-A-N-D, hand. And uh, it might take us a little while to get there, but we will get there. And I have two passages of scripture that we're going to get to tonight. And the first one I want to give to you, if you have your Bibles, is uh, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And if you have a physical Bible, go ahead and uh, this is an old preacher trick. Go ahead and stick your finger in it. Go ahead and stick your finger right there. And then if you're using a digital Bible, you can go to Proverbs chapter 16. It's going to take us a little while to get there, too. Um, I'm just going to talk to you tonight for a little bit, and we're going to see uh, how this plays out. So here we are again, week six, right? Week six. Uh, for many of you, I'm sure there are many, many thoughts. For some of us, right, there's excitement. The end of another challenge, right? The completion of another thing, uh, another box that we can check, another uh, for, for, uh, guys here in team California guys here at, uh, team first street church that uh, we finally have one, uh, here in our, our local church. We have a group of guys that are doing first street challenge. Literally our, uh, the, the leader of our men's ministry has made each one of these guys like a poster, like a banner type poster that has the Solcon logo on it and has all of the different, uh, emblems of each of the, uh, challenges that we do the Solcon challenge the Warrior Elite Challenge and Operator. And then uh, underneath each one of those, there's a place to put a little placard for the name of each challenge and the date that it was completed. And so for those guys, another placard that they can put under that challenge, Challenge Timothy, uh, Solcon Challenge and then Timothy with the date. So uh, maybe another placard, another notch on your belt, as it were. So for some of us, there's excitement. For some of us, there's great joy. For some of us, a sense of, of accomplishment. Maybe for some of us, a sense of regret. Maybe you did great in this challenge. Maybe this is your best challenge to date. Well done, guys. Hats, hats off to you. Well done. Uh, maybe for some of us, we sucked it up the whole time. You know what? Shake it off, man. You have another opportunity four and a half weeks from today to start over. So shake it off, suck it up, put on your big girl panties, and, and let's get ready for SoulCon Challenge, Paul. Uh, maybe for some of us, there is this impending sense of fear this impending sense of dread. Maybe for some of us, as, as we look forward to the days of head, as we, as we think about Monday, maybe there's this, this sense of doom, this sense of fear. And for some of you guys, maybe that confuses you. But I'm a guy that knows exactly what that is like. My first challenge was SoulCon Challenge Sierra. And in SoulCon Challenge Sierra, I lost 24 pounds, 24 pounds in six weeks. That's pretty remarkable. I weighed 330 pounds or something like that coming into SoulCon Challenge Sierra, probably more than that. Actually, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I do remember that I lost 24 pounds in SoulCon Challenge Sierra. The problem is, is that in the gap between SoulCon Challenge Sierra and SoulCon Challenge Tango, I gained 27. I lost 24 pounds in six weeks. That's awesome. I gained 27 in four weeks. So I understand. I get the dread. I get the fear. I get the, the sense of impending doom that can come up for some of us in the midst of this uh, in the midst of this gap period for some of us. I, I understand what that's like. Do you know what happened to me in, in that gap period? Do you know what happened? I got lazy. Uh, laziness set in on me. I got really lazy in that gap period. And then my laziness led to idleness. I, I got lazy with my physical disciplines. And, and that started on day 43. On day 43, I thought, I, I, can, I can sleep in today. I can sleep in today. It's just one day. I can sleep in today. And then the same thing happened on day 44. I got lazy with my nutritional disciplines. I got lazy. And then my laziness turned to idleness. I got lazy. And then laziness turned to idleness. Uh, you know what the most important meal of your week is? 
It's the meal that immediately follows your feast meal. The most important meal is the meal that follows your feast meal. Or, or if you take that much liberty, it's the meal that immediately follows your feast day. I've gotten to the point where I don't take a feast day anymore because I can't handle it. Right? I know me. I can't take a feast day. I'll feast a little bit here and there, but I'll, I'll allow myself to indulge just a little bit here and there. But I know me. And I know that the most important meal is the very next meal after my feast meal. And, and so I got lazy with my physical disciplines. I got lazy with my nutritional disciplines. But worst of all, I got lazy with my spiritual disciplines. And just like with my weight, that slide took me to a worse place than ever before. Like I, I lost 24 pounds during Sierra. I gained 27 pounds during the gap. I was in a worse place with my weight than I was when I started Sierra. And, and even though I could do more push-ups and I could do more sit-ups than in my initial test in, I was in worse physical condition, even though I was a little bit stronger, I was really in worse physical health because I had gained more weight than I had before I started SoulCon Challenge Sierra. And, and even though I had spent six weeks getting up every morning, getting in the word and having my quiet time and doing my, my disciplines as far as reading the book and doing the challenge and doing all of those things, I, 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 I did those things, I, but, but yet I, 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 I fell to a deeper, darker place in the gap. And it was harder for me to pick up those disciplines starting with SoulCon Challenge Tango. And I actually was, you know, the brilliant guy that said, oh no, I can handle the SoulCon Challenge Elite. And so I did that and it was tough and it almost broke me. I slid to a worker, a harder, darker place. In the moment, in the moment of the gap, in that, in that time period, I, I couldn't see what was happening. But looking back, I can see exactly what the issue was. I, I had this sense of entitlement. I, I told myself, you've just spent six weeks in this, in this challenge where you've created these great spiritual disciplines and, that, and, and you're entitled to a day off. And that sense of entitlement that told me that I was entitled to that day off, that, that gave me a sense of contentment. I said, oh, I've, I've earned this day off. And so it gave me a sense of contentment. And then that sense of contentment really quickly turned into a sense of laziness. And then that sense of laziness really quickly turned into a state of idleness. So I will tell you, um, as I get ready to, to go into pro Proverbs, I will tell you that I, I typically use the ESV, the English Standard Version. And I know that for some of you guys, uh, that may be an issue. If some of the guys on this call, some of you guys watching the playback, it may be an issue that I don't use the King James Version. Uh, and and uh, it, But the ESV is my go-to. It's my go-to for reading. It's my go-to for teaching. It's my go-to for preaching. It's my go-to for studying. I know that some of you guys may have an issue with that, and that's fine. I, I get that. And I'd be happy to discuss that with you if you want to. Uh, so feel free to shoot me an email to michael at gaborum.com. And I'd be happy to discuss that with you. Uh, for this case, for this case, uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 27 uh, in, the, in the Living Bible says that idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Uh, I know that that is not a good literal translation, but, but the principle is true nonetheless. When you become idle, the devil can have a field day with you. You, you become idle, you become stagnant, you become uh, lazy, you become content. Man, the devil can have a field day with you. The devil can have a field day with you when you become idle. Man, you don't even have to be lazy. You can just not be on guard and the devil can have a field day with you. The enemy can just take that one little break that you take, just that one little momentary lapse of judgment and it can wreck your entire day. See, you, you have to remember you have to remember something. You, you've got to remember this. And, it, and it's easy to forget. It is super easy to forget this one little thing. And it's easier still in the gap. We are in a freaking war, gentlemen. We are in a battle. There is a battle being waged every day. There is a battle being waged every stinking day for your soul and for the souls that come after you. 
for the souls of your children, for the souls of your family, for the souls of every individual that you come into contact with, and for the souls of every individual that you are called to make an impact on. There is a war being waged for the souls of men and women around the world, and the enemy never takes a break. We can never, ever forget that. And we constantly have to be on guard, and we constantly have to be at the ready, and we can never take a break, and we can never take a gap period from the mindset that keeps us in that warfare mentality. We can never become idle because we are at war, and war doesn't ever take a day off. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 27, a better translation what I think is the right translation, again, Michael at Gaborum.com, if you have a problem with that, uh, says, a worthless man plots evil. A worthless man plots evil. Proverbs 16, 27. And here is why it could not matter less what translation I use. Because I always study the original language when I speak. Because I want to stay true to the text. I want to stay true to the text. So I always, I have ridiculous amounts of digital resources. I said in my breakout session at Minnevala, like uh, my fear is that when I get to heaven, the apostle Paul is going to slap me in the face and said, you did so little with what you had available to you. Cause I, I used to work for a Christian publisher. And so I have, I have a ton of, of uh, digital resources available to me. And, and I have like a 60, $80,000 digital library. It's ridiculous. And I'm ashamed to say that out loud because it was a gift to me and I, I don't use it to its full extent, but it couldn't matter less what translation I use because I go to the original language. So here is what it really means when you study it out in the original language. Proverbs 16.27 from the original language means, a good-for-nothing man digs up all sorts of evil. Catch that. If you're taking notes, write that down. A good-for-nothing man digs up all sorts of evil, all sorts of evil. So, are you a good for nothing man? I mean, that's a tough question. I'll be honest with you, that, that, is, that is a hard question to answer. Are you a good for nothing man? And if your answer is no, then I have a question for you. What are you good for? If you're not a good for nothing man, what are you good for? What are you good for for your wife, for your marriage? What are you good for? What are you good for for your children, for your family? What are you good for? You good provider? Great, that's fine. Money doesn't mean crap. What are you good for? I'm talking about the eternal. What are you good for? What are you good for for your church? What are you good for for your neighbor, for your community? What are you good for? Here's maybe the hardest question to answer. What are you good for for you? What are you good for for you? When, when you look yourself in the mirror, when it's just you and that guy that you shave with, what are you good for for him? And what are you doing that is good for you? And here's a better, maybe here's a tougher question, because right now we're in the midst of a SoulCon challenge, but it's coming to an end. So here's a better question. Come Monday, what good do you plan to do? What good are you committed to do that is good for you so that you can be good for your wife, for your children, for your church, for your community? What is the good that you are committed to? Listen, that 15 to 20 minutes a day that you spend in the SoulCon book, it's over. It's over. It ends Sunday morning. What's next? The daily challenge that you spend prepping your mind for battle, that's gone. That's gone. Monday morning, you'll wake up. SoulCon Challenge book is over. That daily challenge is gone. It's gone. What's next? That commitment, it's gone. No more. So now what? Do not remain 
idle. Do not become idle. Do not become lazy. Find something. Do something. Do something that is good for you so that you can be good for your wife, for your marriage, for your children, for your family, for your church, for your community, for you. For God's sake, do something good for you so that you can do something good for the kingdom. Get in the book, man. Get in the book. The book. Make a commitment to get in the book. Get in a book. I was going to have, I had it. I took it to the church with me because I thought I might have to do the call from there. I just finished, or I'm about to finish. I have three pages left of this book called Praying Through the Bible by Donald S. Whitney. Donald Whitney, for sure. Praying Through the Bible. Guys, I have been in and out of full-time ministry for years. I have been, I have been preaching since I was 13 years old. This book has revolutionized my prayer life in the last few days. I kid you not. It has changed the way that I will pray for the rest of my life. Praying through the Bible. Praying through the Bible. Is that right, Brent? I know you read it too. Did praying through the Bible? Praying through the Bible. Donald Whitney. Incredible book. You can get it on Amazon. It's amazing. Uh, it, you send me a message, I'll send you a link to it. It's, it's an incredible book. Revolutionized my prayer life. It's a short read, like 90 pages or something. Changed my prayer life that fast. Amazing book. Uh, do something. Get in the book. Get in the Bible. Get a book. As soon as this call is over, seriously, don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't say, oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do, I'll do something Monday morning. No. No, you won't. You won't. Come on, I know you, we're men. Half of you guys that are on this call, half of the, 75% of the guys that are signed up for the challenge will never watch this call. Half of the guys that are signed up for this challenge signed up for it in the last weekend that it was available. Because we procrastinate, we put stuff up because we're men and we're stupid. And we can say that here because there are no women around to hear us. We put stuff off until the very last minute or past the last minute because that's what we do. So as soon as this call is over, and listen, I wouldn't even be offended if you get out your phone right now and you start looking for a four-week reading plan to read the Bible for four weeks during the gap. I would not be offended if you got out your phone right now and started searching Amazon for a book that you could read during the gap, a good Bible-based book that you could read during the gap. I would not be offended at all if you got out your phone right now and went to you version and started finding some friends that you know would hold you accountable on the you version app please don't please don't request me as a friend and ask me to do a study with you i have a, a book uh, that a 10 week study that i'm about to start and another eight week study that i'm about to start this week both of those are starting this week so i will ignore your friend i will may not ignore your friend request but i will ignore your request to do a study with you so please don't don't be offended when i do that i'm sorry i'm not sorry uh but fine i i would seriously i would not be offended if you got out your phone right now and begin taking the steps to make sure that you have something to, to do, to, to make sure that you're moving forward starting Monday. Find a four-week Bible plan, Bible reading plan, to make sure that you have something that's going to fill that void in the gap. Find a book, Praying Through the Bible. There's a bunch of good books out there. If you need recommendations of a book that you can read, hit me up on the app. I will send you a list of books that you could never get through in four weeks, even if you read a book a day. Look behind me. You only see part of my bookshelves, and you don't see the, the books that are stacked up over there, and you don't see the books Books that are stacked up over there and you don't see the books that are stacked my wife will not let me buy any more books i have a rule that i'm not supposed to buy a single book until i read two and i don't follow that rule very well uh listen seriously as soon as this call is over or even right now do those things set yourself up for success so that come monday morning you have a plan have a plan because if you're idle you will not you might you absolutely 100% will dig up all of that old evil. Listen, I know that you buried that old man. I know that you buried that old man. I know that that old man, he's dead, and I know you buried him, but you'll dig him up if you stay idle. You will dig him up if you stay idle. How do you know that, Floyd? Because I did it right after Soul Con Challenge Sierra. I am speaking from experience. And I have no problem looking any one of you in the eye and saying, you will 100% dig up that old man 
if you go idle, because I'm man enough to look myself in the eye and say, Floyd, if you go idle, you will dig up that old man because it's the voice of experience speaking it to me. The last thing that you want to do is show up for Soul Con Challenge Paul digging a corpse around. The very last thing you want to do is so show up for Soul Con Challenge Paul, the last challenge cycle of the year, digging a corpse around. Listen, we've talked about what not to do, not to become idle, and how to kind of fill that gap and how to, how to kind of prevent becoming idle. But what are some things that you should do? What are some things that you should do and probably not just should do as gap activities? And I want to ask you a question. What's in your hand? What is in your hand? Let me set this up. I know that most of you know the story, but, but Moses is out in the desert and he's running. He, he's running from his past. That's a familiar place for me. He's, he's running from his actions, right? He killed an Egyptian. He buried him in the sand. He, he's running from that. He's running from his past. He's running from his actions. And he's scared. He's hiding. He's tending to the sheep. And he sees a bush that is burning, that's on fire, and yet not consumed. So like any normal sane person, he goes and starts talking to it. And he's having a conversation with this bush, and this bush is telling him all of the things that he's supposed to do. And now the story is probably pretty familiar to you. The bush is telling him, hey, you're supposed to go back to Egypt. You're supposed to present yourself to the Pharaoh. You're supposed to present yourself to the Israelites. You're supposed to tell them that you're going to be the one that leads them out of Egypt into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to go before the Pharaoh. You're going to tell him all of these things. He gives them details. God speaking to him through the bush, giving him details of all of the things that are supposed to happen and of all of the things that he's supposed to do. And he says, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me? And here's God's response to him. Exodus 4 two through four. And the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And he said, a staff. And God says, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. Hmm. This just hit me. How often do we run from the miracles that God's pre presenting to us? Uh, so he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put your hand out and catch it by the tail. So he put his hand out and he caught the staff in his hand. So I want to ask you tonight or whenever you're watching this playback. What's in your hand? What is that thing that you think is insignificant that's in your hand? For Moses, it was just a staff, a common thing for a shepherd. It's just a staff. What's that in your hand? Oh, dude, it's, it's just a staff. That's how I talk to God. Dude, it's just a staff. For Moses, it was just a staff. But this just a staff had carried him through the desert. It was just a thing that he threw on the ground and became a stake. Later, in front of Pharaoh, he did it again. And then it, the Egyptian magicians did the same thing. They threw their staffs on the ground, and they became snakes. And then Moses' snake ate their snakes. Moses' staffs ate the Egyptian magician's staff. Like, that's crazy. It, it was just a staff that got water from a rock. It was just a staff that was held out over the Red Sea, and it parted. But it was just a staff. What is that ordinary thing that is in your hand? Let, let me give you a few thoughts. In, in case you don't know, do you have any practical skills that your church could use? Music, tech, some tech things are so simple. Like seriously, some things are just clicking a button, man. Can you click a button? Can you push a button? Some of you guys work on computers at work. Uh, some of you guys are leaders. Some of you guys are teachers. Some of you lead teams. Some of you guys are handymen. Some of you guys are super handy. Is there anything that you do in your daily work life that your church could benefit from? Nothing irritates me more than when a man will be a leader in the marketplace and a louse in the kingdom. Nothing irritates me more than when a man will lead in the marketplace and then sit 
in the kingdom. Does your church have a bus or a van ministry? Do you know how to drive? Do you go to church with an empty seat in your car? Who are you supposed to be picking up? Is there a shut-in in your church that would love to be able to attend worship? No? Is there a shut-in in your community that would love to be able to go to church somewhere, anywhere? You don't know? Visit a local rest home. Ask around. I guarantee you, you don't have a car big enough to carry the people that would love to be able to attend worship, but don't have a way to get there. Is there a neighbor? Is there a homeless person that wouldn't feel welcome unless they were walking in on the arm of a well-vetted member of your church? I had two meals recently with a guy that wouldn't let me pay. One was with uh, 15 or more people. I got mad. I got, I got pissed. I may have cussed at him a little bit loudly. I, 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 I did. I did cuss at him a little bit loudly. Uh, and then I was told it, he was using his spiritual gift. He was using what was in his hand. What can you do that can be used for the kingdom? I want you to focus just for a minute. I want to ask you a really, really tough question. Is the kingdom suffering for a lack of you? Is the kingdom suffering for a lack of you? Is the kingdom suffering for a lack of the giftings and abilities that you have? Is there a young boy in your church that doesn't have a dad or maybe has a dad that's present but is worthless? Is there a young boy in your church that has a dad that doesn't know how to lead? Could you mentor the dad to be able to mentor the boy? Could you mentor the boy that doesn't have a dad? The next generation is going to hell in record numbers. What are you doing about it? Is the kingdom suffering for the lack of you? Is there an individual that's suffering for the lack of you? If you still don't know, if nothing hit, if nothing resonated with you, then do this. Get three to five people that you know, that you trust, that know you, and that are not afraid to tell you the truth, and ask them what you are gifted at, and ask them how that can be applied to the kingdom. And if they can't tell you, then just figure it out. Just sack up and figure it out. Here is what I know. I know that idleness will kill you. I know that idleness will absolutely kill you. I know that it will cause you to dig up that which you have put to death. I know that there is more in you than what you are living up to. I know that the kingdom needs you. What I want to know is what's in your hand. I want you to figure it out and I want you to get to work. And as usual, I'm going to leave you with the words of Paul from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men for the love of everything holy. Act like men and be strong. Stand firm. Act like men and be strong.